also request you to mute your video if you haven't, uh, so that you know the uh, the stream is uh, is is break free, like is non interrupted for those with low bandwidth. Um, uh, I I I will uh, please ask as many questions as you can. Uh, please use the chat box uh, to ask the questions. I have my colleague Karthik Ramanathan who, who is going to handle the Q&A uh, and he will uh, pose your question to Joachim uh, towards the end of the session uh, in order that the session continues uh, without any interruption. I request you to type your questions in the chat box and uh, we will ensure that your all your queries and uh, questions are answered. Uh, Rajesh Bhai, if you came in a bit late, request you to mute your video. Thank you very much. And now I shall uh, start by introducing our speaker uh, for this session. Joachim Gerard is the founder and head engineer of the loudspeaker company Audio Physics, the well-known loudspeaker audio company. And now uh, Zuskin. And he is one of the most innovative speaker designers today. His range of speakers has been met with great praise, much due to his ability to combine new, exciting ideas with great technical insight and precision to build quality. So in the beginning, Gerard started out as an amateur speaker builder, just like everyone else. And after building several multiple speakers for his own use, he started to design kits for the German market. And he worked on this from his home until 1983 and then entered into the real business world and founded audio physics. He built his first detector receivers at the age of 11 to listen to Russian long wave transmitters. And his first loudspeaker was a tin box with holes and an integrated small speaker. I'm sure you remember that. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I forgot it. My brother told me. I forgot uh, it. I had it here and I lay in the bed. <laughs> Over time, he... Yeah. Okay, yeah. you do. Yeah. Over time, he became enthusiastic about electroacoustically reproduced music and began building loudspeakers. And by the age of 18, he had built about 500 different pairs, from bass reflex to transmission line to horns and everything in between. He developed many innovations that did not exist at, in his time. For example, on-wall, clang build and isobaric loudspeakers with minimal coupling volume and push-pull technology. And of course, the famous Dymos Hippolyto loudspeaker. which is a once-folded transmission line with a triangular outer. After he finished and completed the studies, his partner Harmut Janssen, he ventured into entrepreneurship and opened a gallery for modern art, coupled with a high-end audio and avant-garde studio, if you will. High fidelity and contemporary art, an unusual and revolutionary idea at the time. And together with Gert Hecker, the current president of the Bahian Society and Laudophile in Paris, Vishnu Hiraga, Gerard Christian, and Patrick Brito, he worked on the German version of the 10 watt Class A amplifier called Le Monstre. You know, the famous uh, Le Monstre uh, <laughs> amplifier. Yeah. Uh, as Trade Magazine became more and more aware of the audio physics brand, his developments were described as magic and best loudspeaker in the universe. And in 1996, Michel Tremor's report and stereophile about the Virgo finally brought international recognition. Furthermore, his, his fantastic and what we're going to talk about today, his loudspeaker setup method was uh, supported by scientific collaboration with Bern Thies and Professor Malcolm Horsford from the University of Essex. And these are secrets that you will learn from him today. He's going to you know, elucidate on his... A fantastic loudspeaker setup. He and Malcolm went on to experiment with Linkwitz Riley crossovers and to prove to Secret Linkwitz, who uh, Joachim knows personally, you know, the Secret Linkwitz is a part of Linkwitz Riley, uh, who designed the Linkwitz Riley crossovers. And they actually went on to experiment and uh, to prove to uh, Secret that his crossovers sounded, why they sounded the way that they did. In his new company, Swisskin, he has developed many new technologies like fractal audio, omni-shape, transitional filter, air-based system, and digital reality. He's a fantastic personality once you get to know him. He's very grounded, very unassuming, and Joachim is always ready to share the knowledge he has acquired over so many years of learning and experimenting. Please, gentlemen, please welcome Joachim Gera. Please take it away, Joachim. 
Hello. How are you doing? I'm quite humbled after this. Uh, it's always very interesting when somebody talks about me. <laughs> <laughs> and and what, what comes into your head, what, what interests you most of my work, you know. But you, you did a very nice roundup, basically. And uh, I enjoyed it tremendously. And I'm really honored that I can talk here so free in the open. I don't have much contacts to India, by the way, and I never was there. Uh, but of course, I, I, I studied a little bit Indian culture, like Buddhism and Hinduism and stuff like that. So, and I like Indian food. <laughs> yeah. We were spicy just in stuff, Munich. Right? You like you like spicy stuff. <laughs> yeah, not extremely spicy, but medium. <laughs> okay. Yeah, should I begin to talk? Please, please do, your It's the floor's on. Yes. Okay, I start. I start. I, I will introduce some very basic things here that you may all know. So it's not about teaching. It is just about going from very simple to a little bit more complicated. So what what is I begin with the question, what, what is sound? Sound is a mechanical vibration in an elastic medium. And air is one of those media. And uh, it is a wave phenomenon. So it's in kind of ways, all wave phenomenons uh, have the same rules. So there is dispersion, there is uh, scattering, there's all these kind of things that also happen in sound. But of course, this, this is not an electromagnetic wave, it's a mechanical wave. It modulates the pressure and the density of the air molecules. And uh, our hearing ability in Hertz, just to introduce uh, Fourier, he said that all sounds can be dis deciphered into sine waves. And uh, it's mathematically true. We use FFT analyzers to analyze what we do. And very early on, people tried to understand what is the range of the human hearing. And the consensus nowadays is that we can hear from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. I can hear only to 14, something like that in my age, because when you get older, you lose the ability to hear the absolute top uh, Frequencies. I tested my son when he was seven or eight and he could hear 23 kilohertz over a Stux headphone. And under 20 hertz, you don't hear anything anymore, but you feel it. For example, when you go into a church and there's a big organ and they have a 12 or 16 hertz tone, you don't hear that tone, but you feel that tone. And also there is some speculation if humans react to frequencies over 20 kilohertz. But the only study I know was done in Tokyo. And they, uh, they took uh, people and, and, and they had a program, con it was a ribbon tweeter that went to 100 kilohertz. And when they added frequencies over 20 kilohertz, they found that by doing brain scans, that, that something happens in the brain. But yeah, I don't know. For me, 20 to 20,000 is fine. So, we have a frequency from 20 to 20,000. That is a span of 10 octaves, what is quite an amazing range. For example, the visible light is, is a much narrower spectrum. So, we see here 20 to 20,000, 10 octaves. That is a huge amount of uh, frequencies. And for every frequency, there is a wavelength. And... Uh, the wavelength of a 20 hertz tone is approximately 20 meters. And the wavelength of a 20 kilohertz tone is approximately 20 millimeters. And what is also important to know is the velocity of the speed of sound. That is on under normal conditions, 20 degrees, uh, zero altitude, it's around 344 meters per second. So now we have the frequency, we have the wavelengths, and we have the speed. And that is more or less all you should know. So 
Next question is, when we have this information, what happens when we confine sound? We put it in a container. So we don't let it flow open. We put it in a container. You could say this is a room, a listening room. And each room has particular dimensions. Uh, in Europe here, it's quite usual to have a standard room of 20 square meters. This is approximately the size of living rooms here in Europe. So it's not as big as in America, but also not as small as, say, in Japan. And our rooms are around 2 meter 70 high, something like that. So a normal sized uh, living room would be five to four meters, 2.7 meter high. And when we now look at the wavelengths, say of 20 Hertz that has 20 meter wavelengths, we understand that this wave as a complete, complete sine wave cannot fit into that room. Only frequencies over a certain wavelengths fit as a complete sign in that room. You could say that the transition frequency is around 80 hertz. So under 80 hertz to 20 hertz, the room does not allow anymore that the complete wave fits into. So what happens is that the sound gets pressurized. The same effect is with your headphone. You take the headphone up, it sounds very thin. You take the headphone on and you hear the bass because this confinement raises the pressure under a certain frequency. Of course, with the headphone, it's much higher up where it happens, but in normal rooms, around 80 hertz. And Martin Columns, in his book, uh, High Performance Loudspeakers, found that in a typical European room, you have approximately plus 9 dB pressure at 20 hertz. So when you make a loudspeaker that is flattened and then called chamber to 20 hertz, and you put it in that room, it has plus 9 dB in that room, so it may sound quite boomy. So one of the important things we learn now is that when you have a certain size room, you need a certain loudspeaker that fits into that pressure range. Uh, it should have, in that room, it should have minus 9 dB at 20 hertz. When you calculate it from 80 to 20, you see that the rise is approximately 4 dB octave. Okay, now comes the frequency range between 80 hertz and 300 hertz. Uh, this is usually the most problematic part of any room acoustics because now the wavelength fits into the room but gets reflected from the, uh, from the walls. So what we get is a standing wave. I find a little animation for you that I will now show you. This is a standing wave. You see left and right, you have the walls and you have two waveforms that interact. And at some points they add and at some points they subtract. I hope you've seen that. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yeah, yes, okay. yes, 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 we did see. Okay, this is a standing wave. It's just m much more easier to see it as to explain it. Yeah. That's and right. This gives, this gives rise to a lot of different problems. So in that frequency range, we have parts of the room where we have a null, where there is no sound at all, and we have other parts where there is a very loud sound. And now I would like to make a pause. I decided that now you can ask some questions before I go to my setup method, because this is the end of the introduction, so to say. So I would answer some questions now, say for five or 10 minutes, or okay. it gets too much, you know, yeah. Okay, okay. Is that fine or? Yes, yes, please. Karthik, are there any questions in uh, this half of the session? Uh, there isn't any question as of now. Okay, if there is anyone who wants to ask a question, uh, they can unmute themselves and just uh, ask the question. Uh, 
yeah. the option of unmuting is there at, available at the, the respective person's end. Uh, the Schroeder frequency, yeah, some call it the Schroeder frequency. There was a German researcher, Schroeder, he was a room acoustic specialist, and I think, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the Schroeder frequency. I have to Google it, because there is another Schroeder frequency higher up, it's a little bit more complicated. Schroeder frequency. Schroeder frequency. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that, that, uh, the 80 hertz. That 80 hertz is not the Schroeder frequency. It's higher up, around 200, 300 hertz, where the standing waves uh, stop and we get reverberation echo. That is the Schroeder frequency. I talk about that area uh, as the next step. We have now 20 to 80 hertz. We have 80 to 300 hertz, and now comes 300 hertz to 20 kilohertz, and and that area. This two three hundred hertz that that is the Schroeder frequency because there is no single modes but there is something like uh, reverberation because it gets too complicated too many waves interact with each other so so, so what you're saying Joachim is that a room uh, behaves differently at different parts of the frequency spectrum so it behaves pressure based from twenty hertz to eighty hertz. From 80 hertz to 300 hertz, it behaves uh, standing wave waves, and from 300 hertz onwards, it's the Schroeder frequency, more reverberation. Oh, there you. Go. Yeah, yeah. I, I I separate it in three different parts. This is the base. This is standing wave area. And this is the Schroeder frequency, and this is reverberation and echoes. So. So, would you say to uh, acoustically treat a room, you need to treat in uh, diff for different frequencies with different kinds of treatments to like treat the pressure zone, the standing wave zone, and the uh, reflection and reverberations? Yeah, problem is that at least in most of the Western society, people listen to high end audio in, the, in their living rooms and they hardly accept any technical uh, help in the form of diffusers, in the form of absorbers and stuff like that. Studios have that, like radio stations, stuff like that. But private person, he wants to live in a beautiful environment. So uh, I try to get the best out of that situation with, without putting in diffusers, absorbers or whatever, because it's simply ugly for many people. It's the same problem here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question. This is Mehul here. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. So when you treat a room, uh, which is, uh, let's say, 30 feet by 20 feet, I'm speaking in feet because I'm habituated to that. Uh, yeah. And suppose there is a false ceiling coming, which is, uh, which lowers the height of the room by your feet. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you consider the dimension of the room? Uh, because I think for base, the frequencies will go through the false ceiling and hit the real ceiling. So do you consider the real uh, st uh, structural dimensions or the false dimensions? Uh, and for instance, the high frequencies, the frequencies will not penetrate and uh, we have to consider the false ceiling. So you talk about the ceiling, okay. Do, did I understand that? Yeah, so ceiling is just an example where there is a, a real concrete uh, uh, structure and you create a false structure below. What yeah, dimensions yeah, 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 yeah. do you consider for uh, base frequencies and uh, for the standing wave frequencies? What dimensions would you consider for the sake of prediction? When you make a brand new room or when you modify an existing room? Modify an existing room. I mean, in India, most of the rooms are made of concrete walls or brick walls. Uh, yeah, in my room, yeah, in, in my, in my, I, I prefer a granite uh, floor and I have a wooden ceiling mm. and around that is concrete and, and brick wall, you know, that is my listening room. So when we have a reflection from the ceiling, I prefer that there is wood because yeah. it gives it's a kind of natural sound. Of course, you could also construct it as a diffuser because when the ceiling is low, 
and the sound goes up and down, you have an elevation effect. It sounds as if the sound would come from very high up. Yeah. And for the calculation of the uh, standing waves uh, and the pressure waves, uh, wouldn't the uh, wave, the, the frequencies go through the wooden ceiling and hit the real ceiling and then come back? You could make it semi-transparent, yeah, with yes. holes. And you can you could create that as a as a absorber, yeah. I haven't done it, but it's possible. Sometimes they do that in schools, for example, here in Germany, yeah. because uh, the rooms, um, a reverberant room is not easy for the teacher to talk because True. they can't hear him. So they they have this kind of uh, plates where there are holes drilled. Sure. But I'm not I'm not a room acoustic expert, okay. really. Okay. Okay. Now, there, uh, I know from experience that many rooms can work much better than people think. And there is no really ideal relationship of dimensions. Hmm. So somebody thinks it's a golden cut. Yeah. Somebody thinks it's a fractal or whatever. I'm very pragmatic. I go to the people, they have their room and that's it. And I try to get the best out of the existing situation and not saying people you have to install a ceiling you have to install a diffuser you have to dis install an absorber they may use it for half a year and then they call me and say no i don't like that anymore i want a, a, a clean living room i want a nice living room that's that's the reality True. you can find books about it about ideal yeah. dimensions but I, as far as I can tell, any dimension is wrong. There is no optimum dimension. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. It's a holy grail. True. Okay. Thank you. I think we can continue. There are no more questions. I think we can continue on. Okay. Good. Now we have the third region over the Schroeder frequency, say 200, 300 hertz. We have the echo and reverberation area. Uh, this is where there is no single mode, but there are so many modes, so many reflections that it gets totally chaotic. And uh, so we have the three areas. We have the pressure zone from 20 to 80, where we have 9 dB plus at 20 hertz. We have the standing wave zone between 80 and 300, and we have echo reverberation over 20 kilohertz. Now you may wonder why human beings are so good in uh, suppressing all these problems and still we are able to have a conversation. Uh, how does the ear do that? It's very simple. The ear separates the sound into three separate times. First, we hear the direct sound. That's always the first sound we read. When there is an object that creates sound, it's always the first sound that comes from the object and not the reflection is always delayed, no matter what. Uh, <laughs> only in a point singularity, of course, <laughs> everything is at once. Uh, so you can say the direct sound comes to our ear and then the ear does something it tries to first to localize where the sound comes from. For example, a noise, a, a flash or, or a car crash or whatever, there is a noise and that comes to the ears. And we have a rise time of around 15 microseconds to decipher where it comes from. And this is even the area where, where you cannot hear any tone, it's just a noise. And we react intuitively in, in, in a very brief period, we decide if there is a danger or not. And that happens with a rise time of 15 microsecond in a time span to 10 milliseconds. So every sound that is slower, uh, faster uh, than 10 millisecond is not audible as a tone, it's only a noise. For example, when I would have, one kilohertz sine wave and I make packets bursts of 10 milliseconds I cannot hear the, the 10 kilo, the one kilohertz only when it's longer than 10 milliseconds I hear that tone so we have the first 
thing between 15 microsecond and 10 millisecond where the ear only deciphers sound, it noise, stuff like that, and decides where it is to orient yourself in the room and you see where the danger comes from, you know. So that is the first direct sound. And then between 10 millisecond and 80 millisecond, you hear sound as a tone, say from a violin or a trumpet or whatever. And everything that is longer than 80 millisecond and still strong enough is an echo. It sounds like an echo. So we have this 50 microsecond to 10 millisecond, we have the 10 millisecond to 80 millisecond, and then we have the echoes. Of course, I don't like when a room is echoic. You can test it very simple by clapping your hands and then you hear all these reflections. So those have to be damped, uh, or it's really annoying. But you can do that with furniture, you can do that with the textile, uh, with, with the carpet and stuff like that. And, Normal people put so much things into the room that they can have a conversation and feel comfortable. So many rooms are not that bad as people say for audio because you have to live in that room and to enjoy that room, you need a good, good acoustics, but that, that is more intuit, intuitive, you know? You just add furniture until the echo disappears. I cannot imagine that you live in an echoic room, like a bathroom. You won't. Okay, then comes the first reflection. Uh, this is usually the strongest. The first reflection, you imagine it that way. The rooms would be mirrors. And you would see the loudspeakers as a mirror image on the walls. And the image that is closest to you, that is the first reflection. Uh, at this point, we do not uh, think about vertical. I think now horizontal, or it gets very complicated because the ear can decipher sound better in horizontal than vertical, you know, in terms of um, imaging. And frontal resolution is better than back resolution. That has to do with the shape of the ears and stuff like that. Also, you do this when you see some danger, you turn your head intuitively to look at it, you know. So this is the first reflection. In our studies in Essex, we found that this first reflection, when it is too strong and when it is too close, it disturbs the image, it blurs the image. It, it sounds as if the image is not so specific anymore, as if you use an older camera that doesn't focus as well as a new camera, like a fog. And so we were trying to find out how far does the horizontal walls have to be from the speakers. And we found that we have to have a first reflection free area of around 10 milliseconds. This is exactly what I told you about uh, in what time the ear analyzes the space. This is between 15 microseconds and 10 milliseconds. And we want that area to be free of early reflections, first reflections. You see, this is a very simple drawing of the situation. You see, I'm sitting on a wall and the speakers are at the focal points of an ellipse because that is the points that are farthest away from the walls. And you see, this, this is the first reflection. So we get sound from here and time delayed, we get sound from there. So we have T1 and T2. And this should be longer than 10 milliseconds. When the first horizontal reflection is longer than 10 milliseconds, it does not disturb the imaging. This is also because of the Haas effect, but today I do not want to talk about the Haas effect because it's a very complicated thing. This is the rule of the first uh, direct sound. Uh, it's emphasized in the brain and also in the auditory uh, mechanical system to make absolutely sure that we know where we are, that we oriented in a room and that we can decipher danger from things that are not so dangerous. We do that uh, it's, it's something here in the spine, what I call a reptile. 
reptilian brain. Can, the reptilian brain. Yeah, you cannot close your ears. You know what I mean? You can close your eyes, but you can do this, but this is too, too slow. So you cannot switch off the ear, you know. It's always there. Okay. Uh, so you understand that I want this first reflections longer than 10 milliseconds away from the direct sound. And the starting point where you place the speakers, you look from the top to the room. It's a, it's a rectangle. You draw that rectangle and you draw an ellipse into that rectangle. And at the focal points of the ellipse, the speakers are most away from any wall, theoretically. You can't put them, you can put them more together, but then they are closer to other points. So I found it's two focal points, and then you put the speakers there. Also, even when you cannot put them there afterwards, just as a starting point, and, and you sit against the back wall, that is also reasons. I don't explain now, but when you have this uh, paper, I think I sent it to you and Anybody can. Yes, we're, we're going to be sharing. We are going to be sharing this PDF with uh, everybody yeah. who's attending. This yeah, because there, there is more explanation. You see here, you see the ellipse, and uh, this is the room mapping. I will talk later. So even when I do a mistake or I forget something, you may find it here. Okay, so I start at these two focal points of the ellipse. Then I told you what has nothing to do with the imaging is the, the tonal things. And the most problematic area is the standing wave. I assume now that you bought a loudspeaker that has the bass response that fits into the pressure zone of your room. When you have a 20 square meter room, you need a speaker that is designed to have minus 9 dB at 20 Hertz with a roll off rate of 4 dB octave and that would give you at the listening point a flat response to 20 hertz so the room helps out in the bass uh, many people don't know that and they buy much too big speakers in much too small rooms and then they get a problem that they cannot remove only with dsp or with an equalizer but that is somehow against the holy grail of high-end audio to do as little as you can to the signal so it's against Occam's razor. So you get another problem. You get the sound of the DSP, you get the sound of the equalizer and stuff like that. So the easiest way is to choose the right speaker for the right room, especially in the bass. And how, what do we do with the area between 80 hertz and 300 hertz? We have seen on that little picture here, I can repeat it for you because it's so funny. Was war das jetzt noch? Das war jetzt hier stehende Welle. Stehende Welle, okay. This animation. So, okay. Ah, scheiße. Excuse me, I touched something. Here you have this standing wave phenomena. So you see some points in the room have pressure and others the opposite. But what you see is, this looks quite symmetrical. You know, actually it's a sine wave with two crosses. It's a double sine wave. And you could say that this phenomenon is worse at even distributions of the room dimensions. So I had the idea just to draw the room and make something like this. You make a grid. You see, this is an even grid. It is four horizontal and four vertical. And the interesting thing is this crossing points. It's very likely that there is a maximum or a minimum of the sending wave that is according to that dimension. So, okay, this is the first thing you do. 
look from the top to your room, draw that little grid and put it on the side. Next, draw this. This differentiates the room into odd shapes, into odd, uh, not, not odd numbers. You know, this is three and this is three. If you would now have two transparencies, one of this and one of that, you could overlay it and you, you get this picture. So this is an overlay of the even and odds, where they cross, you know. So you have mapped your room. Okay. So what, what happens? I have now the speakers into these focal points. I have mapped the room and I saw that where the speakers are now, there is a standing wave problem. For example, a boominess at around 150 hertz. And my setup method is a compromise between the tonal balance and the focus. So, of course, I want a speaker that sounds three-dimensional and, and the sound is totally free from the speakers, but I also do not like when I put the speakers in a bad position that makes it boom or uh, is in a zero point where there, where, where there is a loss of sound. So I have to find a compromise between imaging and tone. And uh, we found that, for example, the speakers would sound a little bit too thin in the bass. Then we simply move them closer to the front wall because when you move the speakers closer to this wall, the bass is even more enhanced. So the first thing I do is when I cannot put them in the focal points, I push them back to a point where I like the range between 80 and 20 hertz best. So I have deep bass and clean. Okay, so I move them to that point. Then, then I move them horizontally. That influences the fundamental tone area. So we can find a compromise between warmth and clearness. Okay. So we found a new position that is maybe not in the focal points, but maybe a little bit more back, but it's also more usual like people. Okay, when I want to walk the room, I do not want to fall over the speaker. So they're usually a little bit more backwards and sideways, yeah? just to make more space for living. Okay. Uh, okay, so you found that position. And what I do next is, I use a mono signal. Usually I use an old jazz recording, say from Billie Holiday, that's done in mono. And then I listen to her voice. And the first thing I do, I want to center the image in the middle. So when she sings in the middle, she should be there in the middle. To do that, we can simply move speakers back and forward. We, we let this speaker where it is, and this speaker we can move back and forward. When you move it more forward, this channel sounds louder. When you move it more backward, this channel sounds softer. So even in a little bit asymmetric room, I can adjust that the image comes from the middle by moving this speaker forwards and backwards until I center the voice in the middle. And what I then do, I turn the speakers around this vertical axis and I listen to the voice if it is well focused. So this is then the focusing. This is the last point of the setup. Now we have good bass. We have nice fundamental tone balance by moving the speakers to the wall, to the sides. We can do that on this grid. We will find out that some points enhance and some points uh, lose energy, you know. So we can find what I call the magic spots. We do not take away the standing waves. We do not take away all the problems. We just place them as good as we can in the real situation. 
Okay, so we have now the width of the sound stage. We can adjust by this. We can adjust the bass by moving this. We can adjust the fundamental tone by moving this. We can adjust the balance by moving this, and we can adjust the focus by moving this. Okay, we have a good position. We wait for two, three days, and then we start all over again. <laughs> so you can also iterate this until you reach a um, situation. Yeah. Because adjustments are interactive, the way to extract more performance from your system is to go through the setup procedure again for fine tuning. That's what I wanted to say. And there are, there are also other tips. When you are seated with your head close to the back wall, some light damping material, such as a small rug or heavy tower placed directly behind you may improve the sound. This is behind because I sit on the back wall. If you move your head forwards and backwards, at some point between the ball and three feet away, you can hear changes in the apparent energy, as mentioned in the discussion about base room boundaries or high pressure areas. When pressure is high, the velocity of the sound wave is lower. As you get a little further from the walls, the system will sound a little bit more lively, but bass impact will diminish. You can adjust your listening position to balance this out. Then finally, when fine-tuning for tonal balance, the initial tone of the speaker affects the sound quite a bit. Listen to the difference between having the speaker pointed directly at your ears or straight ahead with no toe in. You can adjust for a bright or dull room to some degree this way. Typically, speakers pointed directly at the listener will sound more extended in high frequencies because of the on-axis response having less high-frequency roll-off. When speakers are pointed straight ahead, the off-axis response will result in a more energy reflecting of the sidewalls and image will be more diffuse. Okay, that's it. And the only new information I have is about heat perception. Normally, in a stereo system, when it's placed in the equal triangle and you have a plume line recording, you should only, only have horizontal information. But it struck me that some recordings, the voice was coming from, from above. And uh, then I found this book from Jens Blauert about three-dimensional hearing. And he found this Blauert uh, bands. You can Google it and you will find information about it. And this elevation effect comes, for example, when I enhance the frequencies of seven kilohertz, I, the sound goes up. So in the tonal balance encoded is also a, a space information. That's very interesting. And this is just by the tonal balance differences. And another thing is when you want a sound that is a little bit more, say, on a stage level, a little bit higher, you can also uh, angle the speakers a little back, you know, so that the sound goes more up. Th this is not in that uh, scripture. I have to add it. This is some additional information. You can experiment also with vertically shifting the speaker, you know. Yeah, okay, that, that's all. That, that's my thing. That's, I'm ready. So, uh, Joachim, uh, basically, uh, you know, 90% uh, of people orient systems along the width of the room, firing into the length of the room. And what yeah. you have shown is basically turn this whole idea on its head by putting the speakers along the long distance and firing into the shorter distance. So, yeah, it's, it's very clear. When, when, when they play the long way, you have much more horizontal reflection and much shorter time delay between the direct and reflected sound. So you end up with a mixture. Uh, for example, Cardas uses that version, or Wilson, where they talk about zones of neutrality. But I think that this marketing blur, I never saw any scientific work that proved that. And I'm an imaging freak. Other, other people may more care about dynamics or tonal, tonal things. So you can make a compromise. But for optimum three-dimensionality, I don't know any better method than mine. And when you read the reviews over the last 20, 30 years, my speakers were always well regarded for 
three-dimensional imaging so that the speakers disappear. And that needs a certain setup. It just doesn't work in another setup. Of course, of course you could make rugs or diffusers or whatever. But uh, I know some people cannot change the way they live. But when you take it seriously, I found ways to show my speakers in the rooms where even the wife was very happy because I'm a furniture designer. So I could show her maybe the table is better here. Maybe the uh, coffin is better there. Many people do that only intuitively. They do not analyze what's going on in that room. Then they fall always over the same chair and stuff like that, and, and they don't change. Uh, it is possible to make the room beautiful and, and the sound at the same time. But that's an effort that no dealer takes. It, it needs hours, days, years, you know. That's the big problem. You cannot treat everybody that well. There is simply not enough, enough time in this universe. What should I say? Then make a compromise. It's okay. It's not my problem. What, uh, what do you have to say about uh, uh, response of speakers on access and, and the off access response of a loudspeaker? How important is this in setting up and tuning a system? Yeah. Uh, for our 20 square meter standard room, I prefer uh, speakers with a wide radiation pattern. So usually my tweeters have a low diameter membrane and I have quite low crossover frequency to mid-range and bass. So the speakers have a very nice off-access performance, especially no holes or advancements in, in the off-access. You, you, you have to measure on axis and then you turn the speaker and the curves you get should be very smooth. That is a point source. It works good in the near field in my setup I could tell you my speakers are 2.85 meters away and I set, I sit 1.75 meters to the basic axis. Under that condition, a point source works best. When you go into a bigger room, say midfield, you sit maybe two or three meters away. For that situation, I would like a radiation pattern that is, uh, how is it called? Uh, man. Uh, conical? Conical? Yeah, you, you need a waveguide for that. How, how is that radiation pattern called? I have a black hole in my head just. Uh, a lower, lower pattern. Yeah, you see, my, my, the pattern of my speakers is like this in the treble for a point source. And this pattern this this is what, what midfield monitors have. They have they don't have this bend. They are straight lines but they are more and more less amplitude. Constant, I don't know. Constant curvature, you would say? Con constant directivity or something like that. This, this is for midfield listening. And then in a very big space, I prefer a line source or a horn. But then you have to sit five or seven meters away. So there is not an ideal radiation pattern. It depends on the uh, size of the room and how far you sit from the speakers. That Peter Walker discussed that in the 70s when he made the ESL 63. He had a really a lot of possibilities to shape the radiation pattern, but the expert could not find any consensus. I know that point source works very, very well in my setup. And constant directivity works in a little bit bigger rooms, and line source and horns work in really big rooms. So that's, that's my experience. The further you get away, the more you have to focus the sound. And the line source is, of course, superb suppressing vertical problems. And it has a, not a square law, but, but uh, it gets only 3 dB softer with, with doubling of the distance. So it has a far field effect. And the horn is, of course, bundling, you know, so. But I never heard horns that could image, never. And I heard everything. I heard a cappella. I heard uh, avant-garde. They, they don't image. 
no matter how far you sit. But I heard apogees in the 80s, they could image when you sat five or seven meters away, but it simply didn't work in our room. So I put it in my studio, a scintilla, and it was so boomy in the base you won't imagine. Because only in the far field, the high frequencies are loud enough, you know, because they are bundled vertically and you have this 3 dB law. So you have to sit five, six, seven meters away and then it works. But I couldn't make it work in my 30 square meter room. So that was a typical example of a good speaker in a wrong room or the other way around. Nothing was wrong with my room, nothing was wrong with my speaker, but they just couldn't marry. That is part of the art. Joachim, uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, odd shaped rooms? You know, we just, we, right now we're only talking about rectangular rooms. What if, you know, typically we see living rooms are L shaped or they are, you know, uh, T shaped. Yeah. So how, what, how would you set up a system in a room like that? Yeah, in our little private session, we already talked about some solutions I found over the years. Uh, I start now with a very small room. Sometimes you only have a very small room, say in Tokyo or whatever, maybe only 12 square meters. And under that conditions, you cannot put the loudspeakers in a focal point of an eclipse, ellipse. So this is the square meter room. It is three by four, say, because this is 12, okay? I found a good solution, also sitting on the back wall, and putting the speakers extremely close, approximately in the middle of the depths of the room. So under these conditions, the early reflection merges with the direct sound, and there is nearly no time delay. And curiously enough, this sounded extremely nice, that room. I was very happy, I listened there very often. I had little steps, the smallest audio physics speakers, they worked like miracles here. And this is only 12 square meters. And of, you use the room very well because the speakers are directly, it did not work when you put it here like the English do. I don't understand that setup, really, I don't. It, it doesn't image at all. And this is then this, this flat earth movement, you know. Of course, here you have an enhanced pressure. You can use smaller speakers, but the image only happens when you move the speakers as close as you can on this axis through the ears. And I found this middle point the most interesting. So that is a solution for a tiny room. Okay, another solution, L-shaped. Now I come with another one. Uh, we have rooms like this in Germany. Huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we have these in India too. Yeah, we have here the kitchen table, and here we have the seating area. This is so typical. Okay, Pick what it, is the it, solution it, for it. that? Okay. You need a sofa here, and you can place the speakers here. I mean, Great. this edge is, is, is a little funny, you know. <laughs> Normally you don't want to look at an edge, but I, I had one customer, it was the only solution and he wanted that three-dimensional sound, so I said try it and he was very happy with the results. So you see with a little creativity you can find solutions that work more or less well. There's an interesting question here, Yogi. Uh, 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 someone has asked a question regarding how would you set up a, a room which is a home theater room for also listening to music? So home theater normally set up in the longitudinal way with the speakers, you know, behind the screen, which is on the shorter uh, width. So how would you set up uh, speakers in a room which is used for home theater, but also for listening to music? Uh, the same speakers? Ideally, ideally, yes, the same speakers. You wouldn't want to have two sets of speakers. Yeah, there is no big choice, you know. I cannot change the position when there is no other way to change it. I mean, the only thing may help is DSP. But when you have horizontal reflections, you destroy the image. That's simply the case. There is no other way around it. Of course, you could do damping on the sides. That also we did when we worked with Essex. We had a black room. 
And we, besides putting the speakers in the focal points, we also damp the first horizontal reflection. So that is what you can do. Just take a mirror, sit there, and your friend takes the mirror and walks the room to you until you see the mirror image and then place some damping left and right. And then you, you have a nice, nice uh, improvement when you cannot move the speakers. But should this damping be for the entire frequency spectrum or does it only matter? No, no, no. The... no, no, no. Under, under 300 hertz, you lose the ability to uh, um, localize. And many subwoofer systems, uh, satellite subwoofers work on that principle because there's only 18 centimeter difference between the ears. But when you calculate the numbers, you will see that under 300 hertz, there's simply not enough time delay that we can decipher. So it is good enough when you damp, say, 300 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And that can be done with maybe a 10 centimeter deep diffuser or absorber. Base absorption is another problem. I never solved that. We built really huge absorbers and they simply didn't work. You can do that with an active subwoofer that has a microphone, makes an anti-pressure, something like that, but there are other solutions. I don't like to destroy energy. I'm happy when there is energy. You can always damp a peak, but it's hard to push energy into a hole because it will even have a worse effect when you have an interference. So, what should I say? Every system that is adjusted for visual niceness must not be the optimum configuration for the best possible sound. And then you must know what you want. Do I want the best sound or do I want the best picture? I mean, in, in a philosophical sense. And I cannot help people that are not willing to change when they have a problem. It's like you go to the, the tooth doctor and say, oh, this hurts, but please don't drill a hole into it. Every gain comes with another, with, with, with a loss. That's the way of the world. You know, uh, Joachim, we've seen uh, many uh, a, a very senior uh, installers and uh, tuners not only work with placing of speakers and placing them and angling them and focus like what you spoke about, but they also utilize some things like, you know, pillows or empty boxes and place them in strategic locations to finally get that last bit of tuning. How important is this aspect in tuning a stereo setup? I mean, does it really help or is it just, again, marketing blurbs? The problem is, Actually, I started all this in the 90s where I imported uh, room acoustic elements from uh, a company in America. And we tried to help people by putting in diffusers, absorbers, and whatever. And 90% of them took it out after half a year. That is one problem because it's simply so ugly. People don't like, of course, you can put it like a picture or, or make it from nice wood and stuff like that. So make it more pretty. Many people have tried that. But I do not really talk to people at all about room acoustics nowadays. I simply don't want that they feel that there is a problem. It, it is psychologically totally wrong to talk to people into a problem. Then you solve a problem by shoving stuff into it, and after half a year, the people are unhappy because the aesthetics do not match their sensitivities. So I went out of room acoustics. It was really frustrating. Also, you couldn't make any money because the elements were not that expensive, but you spend hours, days, and years on stuff like that, and I don't have the time. So I let other people do that. I'm not a room acoustics expert at all anymore. It's against what people want. They want prettiness, they want beautiness. They, they want 
a home that they love, nicely decorated with nice furniture, nice pictures and stuff like that. And all this big electronic racks, this big cables and stuff like that, we see a strong movement in Germany that people throw out their huge 100,000 euro system and put it in a much smaller system because they say, I cannot live anymore with this. It's uh, absurd. A speaker for 100,000 euros, I mean, I build a house for that, in that area I live in. Well, they, should, they could build, a, say, a garden house with a listening room for that money. But it's because of the dealers. They, 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 they find somebody with money and then they talk him into buying something expensive. But there is no plan how to adjust the sound or make it a beautiful sound. They just sell the stuff and that's it. And then comes the other guy. It's, it's, a, it's a pathetic situation. I, I think uh, high end is dead. It's now more into beautiful system and beautiful living. That, that's where I see the future. That's the reason why I make my things as pretty as I can. It's furniture. And then, then the wife says, okay, I accept that. It's not a bad box, but it's a nice sculpture. This is much more of a problem than any room acoustics or other problems. It's an aesthetic problem. Uh, what uh, what do you have to say about uh, racks and amplifiers being placed in between speakers? Does that uh, like kind of break the stereo image or break the sound stage? Or and how how high should a rack be, or should it all be laid out on the floor? How important is that piece of diffusion or equipment in between two sets of speakers? Yeah, the most prone to vibration is the the analog turntable. That's for sure. And of course, I try to put the turntable where the loudspeakers do not directly radiate into the turntable. So it starts to vibrate. Some designers also say that CD players are prone to mechanical resonances. Other people say even cable uh, are prone to mechanical resonances. Uh, well, I have a little luck because somebody that worked for me later founded Finita Elemente and they made beautiful racks and I just got, a, got, a, got it as a, pres a present. <laughs> it works for me. It's from polished aluminum and wood. I, I prefer natural materials like uh, metal or wood. I have nothing against glass, by the way, that has also interesting properties. And of course, some people are so sensitive that they can't even hear the plugs on their cables and they, they hear when they clean them. Many pe some people put a, a, a Schumann generator into the room and claim it sounds better or they have little pyramids or whatever. Room dots, room dots to stop room walls resonating. Yeah, it's, it's a ritual. It's a ritual. And everything that helps you enjoy the music better is fine with me. But my problem is when there is no explanation and that stuff is much too expensive. Then it gets, uh, I, I think it's, it's like a thief. Somebody that sells things like that, it's snake oil. And... We have a very strong esoteric movement here, you won't imagine. People have roses and little pyramids and all of that kind of stuff. And wow. And, that, and that they claim that helps the sound, is it? Yeah, yeah. Many times makers like that say, oh, there is electromagnetic smog. And then they sell the people a little plug that they put into a wall. It costs 200 euros. And they say, now the fog disappears. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's true. It's true. I, I really say, well, people put the cables on little razors. Uh, that I've seen. I've seen at the high end shows. I've seen that people sell them. Uh, all, all kind, yeah, but the speakers uh, are set up terrible, but the system is highly tuned, you know. The speakers in the room is the most important thing. Everything else is not that important. We have good amplifiers nowadays that are not expensive. We have good sources 
with your stream title or Kubus, for me it's fine. We have DA converters from China, they cost 100 euros and they are nearly perfect. You can look at Amir, Audio Science Review, he it's a very interesting thread where he makes objective measurements. So we have something what I call convergence. There is no problem with the source of electronics anymore, but there remains the mechanical problems placing the right speaker in the right position in maybe a not ideal room because people want to live there. That is the main problem for me. Well, everything else, cable, plugs, uh, cleaning, uh, is not so important. But of course, it's a hobby, so people want to play around, you know. When the houseman buys a cable for 10,000 euro, his wife doesn't know. He can shove it into a room without uh, arising her interest. If she knew? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, they were all, it, 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 man wants to play. It's fine for me. I just do not care about this esoteric stuff. When it does not have a physical effect, I don't care. I, I, I can take a candle and light it. Or take a nice glass of wine and smell the taste and look at it. That's enough for me. Or put some flowers on the table or whatever. So, uh, you know, this this uh, definitely raises a question that I'm sure a lot of people are itching to ask is, uh, what what about low frequency? I mean, how important is low frequency in a system? And where yeah. would you ideally place the low frequency generators? That is the subwoofer. So, yeah, yeah. I know that's a whole different ballgame and that requires a whole different session. But if you could just lightly touch upon uh, this topic, which will keep our viewers interested, maybe for the next session. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think every system that is more expensive than four or five thousand dollars needs a deep and good base. You cannot sell expensive speakers that have no base. Because in the base is the emotion and the fun of the music. It makes the rhythm, it drives the music along. And we have good experience with subwoofers. We made a lot of them in the 90s that got very famous. It was the Terra reviewed by Martin Columns that said it's the most atmospheric woofer I ever heard. I made the Minos that got an incredible review on absolute sound where Robert Green, that is a mathematics professor, said that I'm like the Greek Thales and can draw a perfect cycle. So I have good experience making so-called audiophile subwoofers uh, that are not optimized for maximum pressure, but ours had a frequency response that went down to seven or even five hertz. I saw a study of KEF where they equalized the subwoofer deep down there, and the improvement in group delay at 20 hertz gave an audible difference. So we made them extremely wideband in the deeper region. That, that is one way to improve the impulse response because every bandpass filter has an impulsive answer and I want an, uh, I want optimally, I want uh, an aperiodic system where the pressure does, does not come up again, but the pressure simply disappears into the negative and then in infinite time it makes zero pressure too. But that is the design of the subwoofer, but has nothing to do now with the placement. But where I place the woofer, I would place them in a corner if that's possible. A mono woofer, I may put somewhere else. Okay, this, this is the, my situation, okay, that room. So a mono woofer, I put either here or even here, under my seat or behind my seat. That is a very interesting point because the woofer will be very loud here and also you don't have any standing waves because you sit in the near field of that woofer. Huh? That is a woofer, <laughs> not a sofa. <laughs> and in stereo, I would put them here and there because in the corners you have 12 dB gain. So you have to do not have to turn up the woofer so loud. 
Also, you can put woofers here and there. The Thule system is four woofers each in each corner. My system is putting a woofer with positive pressure here and negative pressure there. We talked about that yesterday. This is an artificial dipole that works in my room. In other rooms, it may not work. You can also study Geddes. He did a lot about multiple woofers. Uh, or also the guy that has lexicon. How is his name? He has a German name. Griesinger, and there was a study from the University in Aarhus about time delaying, and also Malcolm Hawksford did a study with multiple woofers. He called them chameleon arrangement. So there is a lot of work. Currently, I do not manufacture a subwoofer, so it's not a big issue for me momentarily. But I like when the subwoofers go down very, very deep, and not only optimized for pressure, but also for timing. Many audiophiles say they can hear the woofer. Even when they turn it down, there's something wrong in the timing. I don't know if I explained that correctly. I can't understand you. Ah. Hello? There is, uh, there, is, there is a question here about diagonal setups, I mean, uh, where speakers are in corners of a room. Uh, diagonal setups, yeah. Uh, okay, diagonal. I see that sometimes on shows when I understand that correctly. Something like this. Correct, correct. Yes, uh, something like that. Yeah, that can help uh, to erode standing waves. I saw that on shows quite often. Many people think that the booming goes away and it is better from the sound staging. I'm not an expert for diagonal, but uh, many people do that. Yeah, it works. So would you utilize degree. your your same uh, system of drawing the ellipse and touching the diagonals and then putting it on the focal point of the ellipses of the ellipse there? Well, this ellipse thing that is just a philosophical thing, you know. It's an ideal that you can never reach. The message is. The further away the speakers from the sidewall, the better. Except in this small room where you put the speakers directly on the wall. Mostly this horizontal things, also when you, when you see here, you, re, you have a quite complicated situation returning the indirect sound. You see here? here and here. One speaker is much closer concerning first reflection than the other that's more, more longer away. And I would swear that the sound hangs on the left side. The left speaker will sound louder. To compensate that, you can move this one closer, you know, but you will never reach perfect symmetry. It's just a trade-off between time and pressure. Uh, this is Karthik here. Pazi? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Karthik. Uh, I just wanted to know, can we start the Q&A session? Your, your voice is not audible. I think you have muted your... It's up to Joachim. Joachim, if you're okay uh, to start the Q&A, or do you want to touch on any uh, further topics? Um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I want. <laughs> take take for me what take from me what you get. <laughs> I have I have a 
I have a question. Actually, it's a visual question. I'm going to turn on my video. One second. Uh, this is an interesting one, actually. You can see if you can make some sense of this one. Okay. Is my screen you. visible? I, I see you. What do you you want to show something on your screen? Okay. Put yeah. it more left. Put it more left. Put it to me. Is Closer my... to the okay. Closer to, yeah, that's it. Okay, that, that's a typical high-end setup with subwoofers in the corner and the speakers not angled yeah okay that that is a typical high end setup yeah. uh, is is that setup clear i see it okay. so in this in this setup there are three uh, subwoofers stacked one on top of the other in yeah. on left and right with yeah. tiny uh, bookshelf kind of speakers on stand what i think it could work setup? when 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 you when you sit very close but i would to angle them in i would them a little bit further away and I would sit very close. What happens in that situation is that you get the total diffuse sound. It may sound very impressive, but there is nothing in terms of imaging or three-dimensionality in that setup. It's just placed aesthetically, as I say, traditionally. But where is the tradition? Where is the guru of the tradition? Can you please talk to me? But there is no information. People just place it where they think they should place it, but they don't think about what happens when they place it. It's just a aesthetic thing. It's, it's impossible to analyze something like that. I have to be there. It's wrong. Briefly. Uh, another question. Another question that was asked, Joachim, uh, was um, many people say that the wall between the two speakers between should be treated with diffusers, with heavy diffusers. I mean, should it be absorption? Should it be diffusers on that wall? I mean, if you had the ideal room where you could treat the room and the customer does want room treatment. You mean the, the wall between the speakers? Yes. Did you say that? Yes. The back, back wall. The back, the back wall. No, no, the back wall. The back wall. Not your back wall. The wall behind the speakers. Uh, the wall behind the speaker. That's right. That sound comes very late. You know? Problem is, of course, when you put the speakers very close to the back wall uh, and the speaker has a white radiation pattern, there, of course, you have an echo coming down from the back wall and you lose the depth perspective. It sounds as if the sound would end at the wall. And I know of no diffusing or scattering method that takes that effect away. I never heard speakers that sounded deep, three-dimensional deep, when they were close to the back wall. So what the English do, it just doesn't work for me. You can treat it whatever you want. But but most studios soffit mount their speakers, they actually push them into the wall, you know, in a battle wall. Yeah, that, that was 50 years ago. Not now. They have all these big systems, but they listen with the small ones on the table. They don't use that big systems anymore, the big Dynaudios and the big Altex and JBL. They don't use that anymore. It's there to impress the customers. Maybe they make a rock recording and they play it loud and then the rock guitarist says, oh, fantastic. But it, it's, all <laughs> mini, it, it's all mini monitors, near field, 90%. Okay, the radio stations, they have a little bit bigger ones, the big Neumanns or stuff like that, or big Gaitines. They have maybe 60 to 80 liters. But this huge speakers in wall that is 70s, that is Hollywood and Los Angeles and stuff like that. In all studios are where they, they don't use that anymore. They sell that to Africa. Also, all the tape machines are gone. It's a pity. And all the big uh, tube mixing boards are gone. Sold for uh, waste money. It's, it's a problem in Germany with tradition, you know. I talked about briefly uh, with you guys about that, that, that. In Germany, everything must be new. Old things uh, you throw away. Everything must be in pristine uh, condition and new, shiny. 
I think that is a very bad trend because uh, we need tradition to understand where we come from. But that's another thing. <clears throat> but, you know, this, this raises an interesting uh, question, Joachim, because I do know that you are an advocate of digital, of the digital realm. I mean, you said so yourself that digital is the future, whereas digital crossovers go, digital sources go. Because we've reached, re reached a certain point in technology where digital comes as close or even better sometimes than analog. Uh, don't you agree? What are your thoughts? Very good digital comes closer to reality, but there is nothing like vinyl playback for me. Uh, I was raised with vinyl and the artifacts like noise and ticks and pops and stuff like that uh, remind me on the imperfection that we humans are. You know what I mean? The striving for the Holy Grail, I really hate that. So I'm perfectly happy with vinyl sound, although I would say this is not reality. This is an art form I enjoy a lot. So I prefer to listen to vinyl when I can, but I don't have time enough. I don't have patience enough. Uh, it has to be adjusted perfectly. Uh, nobody does that, you know, and streaming is so incredibly um, easy. And you have a choice of so much music that 90%, 95% I'm streaming. And sometimes I listen to CD. I'm surprised how good CD can sound. So I think there was some time in the 90s where convergence happened, where digital got as good or better than vinyl in any discipline. You could also record from a turntable make a digital recording and compare to the turntable. I would say under a blind uh, carpet, nobody would hear the difference. I think modern digital is what we call transparent. And of course, DSP is interesting. You can work on standing wave phenomena. You can uh, make a loudspeaker phase linear. You can make steep filters that have no negative effect on the phase. Uh, I work very closely to Dr. Brüggemann that also works for Rune and makes the foldings, what, what we say. Problem is, you end up with systems like the key or the grim or the gegentakt or the accord is a new breed of loudspeakers coming now, fully active, fully DSP. Uh, problem is, I never heard them well on shows, although they have the potential. And I think the problem is when you have a tool like that that is so strong, you can do a lot of mistakes. You can buy a Ferrari, but you can't drive it. Every, any, any super sophisticated technology needs a lot of knowledge to use. So in practice, sometimes a simple two-way system and a CD player sounds better than a key that should have much bigger potential. You know what I mean? Yes, yes, I, yes, absolutely. And, and customers, they don't like complexity at all. They want to go home and listen to the music. They do not want to fumble around with the DSP or stuff like that. I don't say it doesn't work, but it needs an expert. And there is no expert at the dealer side. They don't have time. They, they cannot go five hours to a customer because they lose deals. And they are in expensive areas of Germany. They have huge buildings. You won't imagine we have studios here. They are so nice, it's unbelievable. Optically, man, visually, sound is poor. That, that's another problem. So it's you also, can... hmm? go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, I said everything. Yeah. So we we have come up to ninety minutes uh, in the session, and uh, yeah. I think if we could just take a few questions, uh, that would really round out this session really well. You know. So Karthik, okay. would you like to take over, please? So I'm just going to run through the questions one by one. And I believe many of them have been already answered. So uh, there's one question which has just come recently. And that is, do speakers with waveguides like Kef, do they require a toe-in? You mean wave, speakers with waveguides? Yeah. Yeah, I, stu I do a speaker like that called the Surveyor. It has a waveguide and has constant directivity. They work very well in the midfield. 
So when you sit more than two meters away, then a waveguide really helps. And the near field doesn't make a big difference because you have so much direct sound that it can be a point source or, or, or a constant relativity design. They won't, it won't sound much, much different. But when you sit further away and really get the side reflections, you better have a tonal balance around the speaker that is steady so that the reflections that reach you are tonally acceptable con uh, compared to the direct sound. So I would listen to that speaker, say, in more than two meters, up to three, four meters. And then when you sit more than five meters, I would prefer a line source. So it, the radiation pattern tells you how far you have to sit from the speakers to get the optimum result. There is no single radiation pattern that does it all. I talked about Peter Walker when he talked to, to experts about it and they couldn't agree. Some said it must be narrow, some said it must be wide, some said, you know, it's complicated. The, the question, uh, Joachim, was whether these speakers require a toe in. Do you need to do that focus alignment that we spoke about by turning the speaker on its axis towards the listener with a waveguide yeah. speaker? Do you need to do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I do that. I do that, yeah. And I hear the difference. I mean, there's always more energy. Even the best waveguides have a loss, not in extension, but in volume. Yeah, no matter what, there's always more energy in the zero axis. Or you make a 3D, a 3D you make, a, 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 I can show you, you make a speaker that has a 360 degree radiation pattern. Hmm? That, that sounds the same from any direction. But the disadvantage is that this has incredibly lots of diffuse sound. So that really sounds better in the focal points of the ellipse. When you put it near a wall, it's a total chaos. You could, of course, make it asymmetric, not in the middle, but maybe more in the back or more in the front. So you could shape it a little bit asymmetric. I'm just playing around with that momentarily. Uh, shall we move on to the next next question? Yes, yes, please do. Yeah. So uh, there's a repeat of a, an earlier question. Uh, Rajesh asks, my sitting room is in the middle of a L-shaped room. What should be the ideal arrangement? Maybe if you can just uh, once again repeat that particular discussion of the L-shaped room. This? That's right. Yeah, that, that's my solution. Sitting no, no, here. no, 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 Johan, uh, Joachim, this is not. See, I am, I am sitting uh, in middle of this longer part of L shape, and my speakers are behind the wall. Behind, uh, no, no, I am sitting here. Yes, 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 and speakers are towards the wall. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you can see there is a lot of space behind me. So, what should be the ideal uh, solution in this case? Boy, that's, that's a hard one. Turn it around. Sit here and put the speaker there. Turn okay. it around. Sitting here is unfortunate, you know. You have very low pressure here. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah. it's also asymmetric. When yes. you sit here and have the speakers there, it's better, I think. This is not easy okay. to solve. It's impossible, you know. Many okay. people think when they sit free, it sounds better. I know that philosophy. I was only in one room where it worked. It was a block house from wood. And the room was really big, so 80, 90 square meters. And in that room, it really worked when we sat right in the middle. But that was an ideal room because the wooden reflections, they were very nice. And uh, it, it was a, a shaped, oddly shaped and stuff like that. So in that room, we sat right in the middle. But in most rooms, when you see in the middle, you have such a loss of pressure that you have to turn it up loud. And then, of course, you have more early reflections from the side. So... Uh, you cannot get that 15 microsecond to 10 millisecond window, but you need to 
decode the location where you are or where the danger comes from. It's just in our spine. We, we cannot make a decision. It, it's, it happens. It's a okay. phys physiological thing, you know. Uh, Rajesh, there is also there is also another idea. What what could help? Place the speaker where you sit, and stay there where the speakers were. Reverse it. Can you show in the on the paper? Yeah. This should be approximately the situation. Okay. Is it that way that he has the setup or more this way? Yeah, this way is the setup. Yes. This way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. I mean, I just say, you know, what, what is a very, it, it's not only valid for this setup, but you know, here is the loudspeaker. Here do you sit. Make something very strange. Put this loudspeaker where you sit and sit there where the loudspeaker is. You reverse it. Okay. And then by moving that speaker, you can find an ideal position where it sounds best when you sit here. Okay. Maybe there is a place to sit that sounds better than any other, regardless of the horizontal problems, you know. <laughs> you can also move the seat and not only the speaker. Sometimes you have to move the seat to get a better sound, no? just let the speakers where they are. That's at least one approach. <clears throat> Can we move on? Yeah, from my side it is clear. Okay, thank you, Rajesh, for the question. And uh, I'm getting back to the Q and A. Uh, there was a question from Roshan. Uh, Roshan, uh, do you want to ask this question directly to Joachim? Yeah. You might want to unmute yourself. I think that's already answered, uh, Mazi. Okay. If, if that's so, I'll move on to the next question. Okay, actually, I, okay. there's a question regarding involved speakers. Now, the question is, many of the clients prefer involves as they go inside the walls. Also, many big brands coming with involved series. Is there any opinion that uh, Joachim has on this particular uh, involved speakers? Yeah, first I can understand many people want that because it's aesthetically pleasing. The speakers are just flat and they don't stand around. But it has that problem that now the back wall and the speaker is merging, so there is no depth of imaging. The wall is there, you hear that. You cannot take that away. The only solution I ever heard that works kind of that is the beverage. The beverage was also on the wall you could also build it into a wall, and it was a line source, a slot. And it was a half cylinder. That, that worked beautifully. So I have one idea to make a slot in the wall and put many wide band drivers there, and on the other side the same. And then you sit that way. That would also solve the long uh, wall problem. That would be this way. This the beverage was it was a column. And it had a lens. 
so that that gave uh, I heard it at Peter Forsellen that gave a tremendous three dimensional imaging. Beveridge always said, "I work with the room and not against the room." That that works. But there's not there's nothing on the market like that. This is a very interesting setup, I must say. You can also listen here, but then left and right are <laughs> the other way around. Right. That is a study the beverage. He, he, that, that works really well and makes a three-dimensional sound. There are other setups. I, I did a, an editorial for linear audio where I have also other ideas, but it's, it gets complicated. I also have a patent called Gekreuzte Schallwand there, where I made experiments with up to seven or eight dipoles. But then I lost the overview. <laughs> <laughs> there are many ways to skin the cat. I am moving on to the next question, uh, Joachim. And uh, possibly this is the last question. Because we are out of time and uh, generally when it goes beyond 90 minutes, people get a bit, well, they lose their concentration. The mm -hmm. last, uh, it, in a situation, Paul asked this question, in a situation where you have bookshelf speakers for a large room, would keeping them closer against the wall improve low frequency response or would investing in a subwoofer make better sense? Considering the wife won't allow an extra speaker. In yeah. Bracket. Yeah, the bookshelf speaker. That is a typical situation, 1960, something like that. Brown did speakers like that, and people put them on a shelf. Uh, no dimension, no three-dimensional imaging possible. So you have to live with a more or less good tonal balance. And of course, the position of the speakers in the shelf when it's close to a wall helps to gain the base. So you can use a smaller speaker than usual. That's an advantage, but you lose the three dimensionality, especially the depth information. So you better have a subwoofer and satellites that you can put free somewhere in the room even when they're quite small. Hmm. So a satellite system would at least help in that situation. I, I simply don't like it. It's, it sounds like an old radio. No three dimensional imaging and no DSP can correct it. I never heard it, at least. Maybe there is a genius somewhere that can erode the back wall electronically, but I don't know how to do that. You simply hear that they are placed into that uh, into that furniture because of the localization ability of the human ear. You hear that they are there and not the music free in front of you with my placement. You can enjoy the music still, the tone is there, the balance is there, maybe they are uncolored, maybe there is also resolution, stuff like that, but you destroy the imaging. And that is my mission. Fair point. Uh, I think Marzi, we can... Uh, maybe, uh, if there is no more question from the audience, I think uh, we can uh, call it a day. So, so um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Joachim, uh, so much for taking out the time. We know you're very busy because, uh, you know, we pre postponed our initial meeting several times. Uh, but thank you so much to take time out from your very, very busy schedule to speak to us. All of us have learned a great deal and a great amount from you. And uh, it's really demystified this process, which... Uh, uh, many people claim is voodoo or magic or mystery as to how certain people are able to, you know, set up a stereo system so perfectly. And thank you for really explaining that to us. We've learned a lot of uh, ideas about uh, rooms and interactions of rooms with speakers and ideal positions of speakers and various problems which you've solved for a lot of people over here who just didn't know how to go about them. So. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your intents. And uh, I'd like to, of course, take this uh, and call out on Karthik. Thank you so much, Karthik, for you know, organizing this. I mean, it was thanks to your initiative that we managed to get a luminary like um, 
Kim to speak to us, impart some knowledge to us. So I thank you once again. And just before we go, I just want to know, you Kim, at the top of your head, I mean, you, you said that you were not a fan of, you know, these really expensive 200,000 euro speakers and stuff. So what price range are your speakers in? You know, this entire range of yours, Swiss kind. I mean, yeah, with, with my income, I would buy a system for $20,000 or euros. Okay. Everything more expensive than that needs an incredible effort. It's like driving a Ferrari. It, it, it may have a huge potential in, in, in some ways, play louder, play cleaner, but the requirements to set it up get exponentially higher. So it's better than it fits. Uh, I think it's stupid to think only 100,000 euro speaker can sound good because they have the same problems. I mean, Wilson has in the Chronosonic scan speak tweeter that a version of that I have in a speaker for 4,600 euros. It's the same tweeter, more or less. Maybe they have an Alnico magnet or any, something like that, or they have a trick in the crossover. But the problems stay the same, you know, no matter what it costs. And, and I'm a pupil of Professor Clippel. He even said that cheap tweeters can be often much better than expensive ones because when you build a big series, you can really tighten the tolerances. Mm -hmm. So reproduce, reproducibility is more important than produceability. Many people don't understand the difference. That's a very good point. That's a fantastic point. Uh, there is one uh, point, one information which I want to give to the audience. Uh, there would be a follow-up session with uh, Joachim uh, uh, on the topic of subwoofers and also low-frequency effects which might happen sometime in the future. So uh, we will announce once that session is up and like uh, ready to go. Uh, once again, thank you, Mazda, and thank you one and all for attending the session. Uh, with that, we come to an end. To the thank you once again. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thank you once again. I enjoyed it a lot. Good thank night. you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Let's do this again sometime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.